DCP Player Free. Get it now from digital.net.au. Hi, this is James Garden, this is New Tech Geek, and I'm at the QSC stand to talk to Barry. Now, an interesting development in the fact that we're now digital and that DCPs now have broadcast quality or production quality audio in them uh, has really changed the way that we should look at EQing a room. Now this is early days and Simpty is working on it a little bit, but I wanted to get a comment from Barry, obviously QSC well respected in the audio game, so obviously he would have a really good understanding and some really good comments on how we should approach this. If you're an installer, should we be doing, still using the X-curve or what? how should we take care of this or what's the best way to get the best audio when you're installing uh, your audio system in a, in a cinema? So what can you tell us about that in, in this stage of the digital transition? Well, we actually got very interested in the whole issue of equalization in cinemas. Uh, and we decided to start our own research program on B-Chain Acoustics. One of the things that, uh, that we quickly discovered was that the big critical important thing is to get the loudspeaker right in the first place. So uh, building loudspeakers that have uh, what's called a flat power response. Yes. So that the directivity of the loudspeaker doesn't have wild uh, uh, changes with frequency. That's right. Uh, it's controlled at the high and mid frequencies by the horns and then uh, it just uniformly increases in angle when you get into the woofers. Uh, if you have a speaker that doesn't have a properly matched horn and woofer and you get a big discontinuity in that coverage, it's going to cause problems when you do the equalization in the room. If a loudspeaker goes from wide to very narrow, it's going to put less energy into the room where it gets narrow in coverage. And by the same token, if it gets very wide, it's going to put more, uh, more energy instead of less energy. And when you're equalizing and your microphones are in the far field, what you're measuring is the total contribution of the loudspeaker and the room, and you can actually, if you over-EQ and, and do too much narrowband equalization and attempt to make all the little bars line up exactly on the X-curve, what you can wind up doing is affecting the direct field from the loudspeaker. And the human ear is actually capable of distinguishing first arrival sounds from the room. So what you measure on the analyzer is not necessarily, or it isn't, what you actually hear in the room. Okay, but, but if, that, if that's the case, like from my understanding, the X-curve evolved from limitations in the distribution formats in film many years ago. Yes. Right? Now we have production quality audio in the DCP going straight into the B-chain, etc. Mm -hmm. Those concerns which evolved to the X curve are now different, they've changed. Yes. So one would say that the X curve will probably need to evolve to, mm -hmm. to accommodate that. Well, so how, how are we going to approach that? One of the things about the X curve is that uh, to us, the X curve is the result of putting a properly designed uh, loudspeaker into a large room. The X curve of you know arbitrarily flat to 2K, 3 dB roll off, that is a very arbitrary number and people are over EQing to hit that exact line. If you read the SMPT 202M spec, there is actually a plus or minus 3 dB tolerance. So what we have discovered, if we take a loudspeaker and we put it into our measurement facility at the office where we can take very high resolution measurements, we can capture the entire hemisphere of radiation from the loudspeaker and create an EQ curve, a high resolution digital FIR filter for that speaker and make it basically as perfect of speaker as we can make it. When we take that technology, put it with our cinema speakers, put them behind a screen and then put the microphones out in the room, you know what? We get the X curve. So between the attenuation of the screen, the attenuation of high frequencies in the air, uh, you know, uh, over the longer transmission distances in a big room, all of those things add up to give you a response curve that very closely resembles the X curve. Now, in larger rooms, it may be uh, a little more roll off, 
and in smaller rooms it may be flat a little higher. And those are the kind of adjustments that we should be making and taking into account when we're equalizing rooms. We don't just want to arbitrarily apply the 2K knee and the 3DB per octave roll-off just generically across every size room. We need to make adjustments. Smaller rooms can be brighter or flatter, and larger rooms can in fact appear to roll off sooner. Uh, and that's really the kind of corrections that you need to make uh, when adjusting uh, to the X curve. So what you're saying here is that, what I'm reading from you is that the X curve, uh, the X-curve is not just about the distribution of the files and its limitations, mm -hmm. but it's a characteristic of the room you're putting it in. Absolutely. The X-curve is a result, not a target. That's okay, right. That's uh, the way we like to think of it, that the X-curve is a thing that happens when a properly designed loudspeaker is placed behind the screen in, in a room. Okay, so, but what I'm getting the message here as well is that going forward with the better quality sound, etc., one has to take more, um, has to use more intelligence yes. when EQing the room. Mm -hmm. And you look at the room and you say, okay, this room, I know to give it the right, the, the, the X curve's gonna be not straight X, it's gonna have a different roll off here, etc. that yes. will suit this room. And that is, a, is an, something you learn from experience and training mm -hmm. and, and, and starting with a good uh, you know a well-designed loudspeaker that that out of the box plays flat and has good power response we shouldn't be using the the room equalization technique to fix a bad loudspeaker yeah okay and unfortunately in the early days of of uh, you know, big A4 speakers, they, they had some significant problems. You know, they were designed for efficiency and they did a great job of that, but they had some characteristics that uh, were not ideal. So a lot of the room equalization was really trying to fix yeah. what was a poor acoustic design for the loudspeaker in the first place. Okay, and that's not such a problem these days. So, so, so really the message I'm taking away from this is that you need to be take more care, mm -hmm. you need to, really, you need to relearn a little bit, mm -hmm. relearn what you've done. It's not, it's not such a, a square hole, square, going to a square hole, you actually, you get a different sized hole now, a different shaped hole, and you have to, uh, you know, change it, you know, you have to accommodate for those changes, accommodate for the environment that's mm -hmm. around you, and not be so black and white in the way you yes. do things. Don't be such a slave to... That's uh, right. Making little bars on the screen precisely line up to, uh, you know, a yellow line. Uh, it's it's just uh, it is possible to overthink it, to over EQ, yeah. to overdo things. We try to use broader parametric EQ and shelving filters whenever possible. Uh, you know, when you're looking at an RTA, it looks like something could be you know very flat and then you know if you look at the EQ settings they're up and down and up and down and up and down uh, what you're not seeing is that a one-third octave real-time analyzer doesn't have enough resolution to really see what you're doing to the signal and that signal that may look very flat and like everything sums very well on the screen if you take a high resolution measurement like an FFT measurement then you can see what you've really done to that signal. And you wind up with little picket fence, <laughs> you know, type of uh, response. And, uh, you know, there's been a lot of research on just how sensitive the, the human ear is to, uh, you know, uh, narrow band, high Q uh, uh, response errors. But I do believe, and we've done enough equalizations that I'm personally convinced of it, that uh, the least amount of narrow band EQ that you can apply in the field is the best. Well, thank you, Barry. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's really good information and I hope uh, those installers out there um, really makes you think about what you're doing out there. So Barry, thanks a lot okay. and great equipment. Good to see you again. Thank you. And that's James Gardner at CinemaCon 2014. Bye for now.